Ahsoka Episode 4, titled Fallen Jedi, was easily my favorite of the series so far, even without the absolute bombshell of an ending. The action was great, the themes were great, the new revelations were great, all the big moments landed for me. I was very happy watching this, and there's a lot to discuss. But before I get into that, I want to remind everyone that the actors and writers are still on strike against the AMPTP, fighting for fair wages on the streaming series they work so hard to create. Disney, for example, isn't agreeing to negotiate on less than one percent of their annual revenue while Bob Iger makes 20-something million dollars a year. I thought this episode of Ahsoka was awesome. I want more episodes like it, but I want the actors and writers to be paid fairly to create them. Diving into the episode itself, Ahsoka, Sabine, and Hu Yang are all still stuck on Setos without a working ship or any way to communicate with the New Republic. As they prepare to face their enemies, Ahsoka tells Sabine that if they aren't able to make the journey to save Ezra, their primary goal should be stopping Morgan and the others from finding Thrawn. On. She goes so far to say as they may have already reached that point, but Sabine disagrees. Ahsoka seems very pessimistic about this mission. The whole series, she has seemed more concerned about Thrawn's return than she has been about rescuing Ezra, and I think that's telling of her character. Ahsoka has been acting very different from how we're used to seeing her in the Clone Wars series, but it makes sense to me. She was bubbly and excitable and hopeful back then, but then the Jedi Council turned their backs on her and then Order 66 happened, and then she thought she lost Anakin, and then she found out he was really Darth Vader. She has been through so much. I think she has lost her sense of hope that the best outcome could happen, and she's replaced it with fear that the worst will happen. We don't know the full story of why she walked away from Sabine, but I expect it was because she was afraid of growing attached to someone else she would just lose to death or the dark side. The same was probably true when she met Grogu, and now the possibility of Thrawn's return is outweighing the hope of finding her friend. I don't think it's wrong of her to at least consider the fate of the galaxy against the fate of one person, but I think she's letting her fear control her more than she realizes, which isn't a very Jedi thing to do, which is just one reason this episode is titled Fallen Jedi. A plus title. I got so excited when it was revealed because it's not just about Ahsoka. It applies to Balin, Marok, Sabine with her choices, and, you know, another Jedi at the end as well. I think all of them can be considered considered fallen Jedi, and they've done it in different ways. Marok betrayed his order and became an Inquisitor, hunting his former peers. Balin survived the Purge, but abandoned his faith. He doesn't hate Jedi, he doesn't seem like the dark side consumes him, but he's definitely not against using it or committing evil acts. We'll talk about Sabine when the time comes, but Ahsoka is similar to Balin. She hasn't called herself a Jedi in years. I think we see in this episode that she has lost her faith and her way a bit and needs to find herself again. I think she is well on her way. She and Sabine began working well together in the previous episode. She offers some comfort to her apprentice as they prepare for battle, but she reiterates the importance of setting aside their personal feelings to do what's right, which again, I don't disagree with, but it's easy for her to say that when she has been avoiding attachment at every turn. Sabine pointed out how lonely her life must be back in the premiere episode, traveling where she's needed, never settling down with friends or a place to call home. It's a noble life, but it's sad to see her like this. Their conversation is interrupted by Morgan's troops, who first attack Hu Yang, and it's really cool to see him hold his own against an HK droid. Dude is 25,000 years old, still kicking butt. Ahsoka and Sabine continue to work well together in the fight, which is just all around cool. They seem to be happier and happier in their teamwork, agreeing with Hu Yang, who asks them to please stay together as they head off to the map area. Meanwhile, Hera heads off for Setos and the Ghost and brings along some friends. I thought for sure those X-Wings were going to try to stop her and was so pleasantly surprised to see Carson Teva and the others joining her. One of the pilots was played by Brendan Wayne, and it's great to have the man who is usually under the Mandalorian's helmet get his face on screen, even for just a bit. At the map ruins, Elsbeth conjures a spell to determine the hyperspace calculations to jump to another galaxy. Balin reminds her that if she's off by even a little, they could be lost to the void forever, which seems like something that could come up later. Also, that set is excellent. I imagine it's all practical rocks, and then all the cool map stuff is done digitally in the volume's LED screens. I feel like I will point out moments where I don't like the volume more than the moments I do, and these shots look fantastic to me. Really, the whole episode does. Peter Ramsey did a great job directing this one. On their way to stop the spell, Ahsoka and Sabine come across their next obstacles, Shin and Marok. Ahsoka's duel with the Inquisitor was fast and exciting, and that last 
last standoff where she timed her strike through his spinning saber was excellent. It's such a good representation of the dark side versus the light. One is violent chaos. It's letting your emotions run wild, controlling you to the point where you lash out in every direction. And the other is calm, centered, and ultimately a more precise tool for living. Okay, a couple things around Marok's death. I thought it was pretty funny, considering all of the speculation that has surrounded his identity. Starkiller, Ezra, Barisafi, I thought he was the eighth brother for a while, but sometimes a story simply calls for a cool-looking henchman. We want an opponent for Ahsoka that's ultimately inconsequential, but how do we visually tell the audience he's a decent fighter? Make him an Inquisitor. So I'm totally fine with Marok just being a brand new character. As for why he exploded into smoke, I have no idea right now. It's similar to what happened to the Inquisitor in Tales of the Jedi, who basically deflated after Ahsoka killed him. Many people have pointed out that Marok is named after an Arthurian knight of legend who was turned into a werewolf by a witch. Molly pointed out to me that the dust does look green as it explodes out of him, so maybe this Inquisitor has actually been dead a long time and then was reanimated by Night Sister magic. Anyway, after Marok disintegrates, Sabine tells Ahsoka to go get the map, and she runs off, leaving her Padawan behind. When I specifically asked you not to? I think that's the big turning point for the episode. A lot of bad stuff could have been avoided if Ahsoka and Sabine followed Hu Yang's advice. I'm not wagging my finger at them, neither of them know what the future holds. They have to make stressful decisions on the fly, but a lot of problems stem from this one moment. Sabine's fight with Jin is also great. Her getting thrown into that tree and losing her helmet was visceral. Sabine still seems completely outmatched against Jin, but her confidence is growing. Of course, she still can't use the Force, and I love that Shin almost reflexively jumps back expecting to be Force-pushed, but she doesn't watch those wrist rockets and is caught off guard. While reviewing The Mandalorian, I have compared their armor and gadgets to the Force multiple times, not just because they made some of their gadgets to mimic the Force and fight the Jedi, but also because I think Star Wars is very much about the power that you have and what you choose to do with it. I love seeing that idea displayed on screen a bit. Sabine doesn't have power the way Shin understands it, but she does have a power of her own, at least enough to send Shin running. Ahsoka's first confrontation with Balin is great. I love that he put his hood on just so he could dramatically take it back off. Rey is absolutely wonderful in this scene, prodding at Ahsoka about Anakin and her past, which she clearly does not want to talk about because she hasn't fully processed it. So they change the topic to Balin's future, and we get some slight teases about what he wants. I still desperately want to know more about him and his motivations, but I'll take what I can get at this point. I'm curious about the fact that he seems to be after something that has nothing to do with Thrawn. It's just that the consequences of achieving his goals will be Thrawn's return and the war he will bring with him. I'm still hungry for more details, but this was enough to satisfy me for a week. I love how disappointed he seems when Ahsoka pulls out her lightsaber. He doesn't want to fight. I think he would be happy to let her join him on whatever his quest is. The setting of the fight felt great and unique as he tries to keep himself between Ahsoka and the map. The build-up where they change stances, test one another with a few strikes, change stances again. It was very tense. Again, Peter Ramsey crushed this, and Balin's fighting style was so cool to watch, he definitely uses the crossguard stance in Star Wars Jedi Survivor. He continues to jab at her feelings about Anakin and her legacy, making her angrier. She is able to get the map out of position, but she wounds herself in the process. And then Shin shows up, leading her to believe Sabine had been killed. So she violently throws her against a rock wall. Ahsoka is using the dark side here. We're seeing how well burying her attachments is working out for her, and that it's not at all. All those feelings are still there. She saw how Anakin's over-attachment led to darkness, but running in the complete opposite direction is no better. Turning your back on any and all connection can still lead to darkness and imbalance. Sabine shows up and has a chance to destroy the map, which of course she can't do for Ezra's sake, and Balin sends Ahsoka off the side of the cliff. If they had stayed together earlier, they could have easily handled Shin. Then the fight with Balin would have also been much easier. Sabine may have been able to find a way to get the map without injury or shut down the connection to the Eye of Sion. 
there would have been more options to approaching that problem, but I think Ahsoka did only see one way, as Balin suggested. We hear that again when he tells Sabine the exact same thing. It's what the dark side always claims, that there's only one way to fix a problem. Balin is probably telling himself the same thing as he goes after whatever it is that he wants. He prods Sabine with what he knows about Ezra being her only family left and about how her family apparently did die on Mandalore, which is heartbreaking to have confirmed, even if I kind of expected it. And then Balin does that dark side thing where he holds out his hand and asks Sabine to come with him. And she does, in such a well-done scene that had me leaning in so hard. Then Shin comes after her with a force choke until Balin stops her. I definitely think there will be some jealousy on her end about all of this. Balin also says Sabine's family died because Ahsoka didn't trust her and claims she didn't keep her word about something. I wonder if Ahsoka didn't let her Padawan go back to Mandalore during the Great Purge. Maybe she was afraid of Sabine's attachment to her family or something and promised and failed to help them in her stead. Balin is such a tease, all these hints but nothing solid. With the calculations complete, Balin destroys the map so nobody can follow them. Obviously he's wrong, because there's never just one and only one way to do something. I've been guessing the villains would get to the new galaxy technologically, and then our heroes would have to find a mystical way, either by following the Pergil or by using the world between worlds or something, but I never expected Sabine would be with the baddies. That shot of the Eye of Sion coming out of the clouds looked sick, and the build-up to its launch was terrifying because we all know what a hyperspace collision can do. And of course, we do lose a few pilots. R.I.P. Brendan Wayne? I couldn't tell if he survived or not, but I'm so relieved Carson did. Jason telling Hera he has a bad feeling is kind of on the nose, but I think it's meant to be like the Force speaking to him. He is the son of a Jedi after all. But also, you almost died, kid. Of course you have a bad feeling. Poor Hu Yang calls out to all of his friends who are now lost because they didn't listen to him, and then we cut into the water, and there is this absolutely awesome transition into the ethereal realm of the world between worlds, which I love. If you don't know what that is, it exists within the Force outside of space and time. It's got access points across the galaxy. Cetos seems mystically important, so it does not surprise me that there would be one on that planet. I do want to know how Ahsoka just happened to go through it, but I'm willing to wait to find out. I mean, Ahsoka herself seems surprised to be there. I admit that I'm also a little worried about how it will be used next week. I absolutely love the idea of this place and how it was introduced in Star Wars Rebels, but it can get very messy very quickly depending on what they do. I'm going to set all of that aside for now. I just want to be excited to see this place again. I love how it looks in live action. I love that a wider audience is going to be familiar with it, and I love that they're probably about to experience the weirdest thing they have ever seen in live-action Star Wars. And they'll have a familiar face to walk them all through it, because Hayden Christensen is back again. Anakin and Ahsoka on screen together, Sky Guy and Snips. I don't fully know what we're seeing here yet. I was thinking we would see Anakin as a Force ghost in this series, and that might be a Force ghost. He isn't blue and shimmery, but the world between worlds might allow him to manifest differently. But he's also in his Revenge of the Sith outfit instead of his Force Ghost Jedi robes from Return of the Jedi. So I'm wondering if that might be Anakin, alive and well, but from a different time. Like maybe the Force or something or someone led him to the world between worlds way back during the Clone Wars to help Ahsoka. He says he didn't expect to see her so soon, as if he was waiting to help her. Maybe she will be able to have one last conversation with her master after she knows what happens to him, but he doesn't know. She can get some closure, but she might also have to remember the lesson she learned last time she was here. She told Ezra there was nothing Nothing she could do to save her master, just as there was nothing he could do to save his. So she might have to tragically let him go back to his time with full knowledge of his destiny. Like I said, the world between worlds is mystical and crazy, but it can get messy. I don't know what they're going to do, I'm a little nervous about it, but I'm going to apply the lesson Ahsoka needs to. I'm going to hope for the best instead of fearing for the worst. I will cross that bridge next week. I will say I kind of wish they didn't de-age Hayden. I would have happily accepted present-day Hayden playing Revenge of the Sith Anakin, but that might be another clue that this is literally a living Anakin Skywalker talking to Ahsoka if they went through all that extra effort. But the deep fakes and the de-aging stuff, it still jumps out at me when I see it. I 
think I'm about done with things to talk about here, but I'll point out that I do wonder how the live-action OnlyFans are taking all of this in. The stakes surrounding Thrawn and Ezra work for me because I was already very familiar with them. Seeing Ahsoka and Anakin on screen is a bigger deal for me because I have known Anakin had a Padawan for a long time. But to some people, this is all relatively new information, and I'm sure they're still thrilled to see Hayden, but I'm not sure they've set up their relationship enough for it to land for that audience. But as someone who has seen it all, this is very rewarding, and I think it's okay that we get a live-action series specifically for the animation fans. It's welcoming to the entire audience, but I think this episode is leaning more towards people who already know all these characters and situations, and I think that's okay. My review is done, but before wrapping up today, I'm going to completely shift gears because I want to shout out some friends of ours, the producers of the musical Wicked, which is just about to start back up on September 15th in Atlanta at Dad's Garage Theater, a place we go to all the time. The show is a parody of the Broadway musical Wicked, retelling the events of Return of the Jedi from the perspective of the Ewoks, and it runs until October 21st. I saw it several times during its first run a few years ago. It's hilarious and very nerdy. Obviously, not everyone watching this is in Atlanta, but if you are in the area and you want to see the show, Dad's Garage gave us a coupon code. Go to the link in the description or dadsgarage.com and use the code EXPLAINED at checkout to get two tickets for the price of one. But that's it for today. Let me know what you thought of Fallen Jedi in the comments. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel for all our Ahsoka coverage, follow us on our socials, and check out our Patreon page for video reactions and audio commentaries for every episode. As always, Thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.